Hey friends, welcome back. So in this video, we're gonna address a question I got over on Instagram, and I'm sure you've had this question before too, and it went something along these lines. Hey Mike, I did my first prolonged fast, something like 72 hours, and my glucose was really low. I'm pretty concerned about this. What does this mean? And I just want you to address this and realize that when you fast for say longer than 24 hours, it's totally normal and actually expected to have a lower than normal glucose level. Now you might say, well, gosh, doesn't that cause hypoglycemia? What about my brain? What's going on? Am I gonna compromise my health as a result of this? And I want you to realize that, you know, part of the reason why fasting is so popular is because it causes this metabolic switch away from a predominant glucose utilizing metabolic phenotype to a predominant fat utilizing and fat burning metabolic phenotype. And many researchers, Mark Matson and Walter Longo and others have talked about this metabolic switch. We talk a lot about this in our e-courses and ways to enhance this metabolic switch, which I can link below if you're interested. But so this is what's normal. And so we're pivoting our body away from relying upon glu glucose utilization. And let me just pause. It doesn't mean that glucose burning totally stops. It does not mean that all at, at all. It just means that other metabolically flexible tissues in the body, including your heart, um, your muscle, and certain neurons in your brain can are starting to utilize more fats and ketones as the predominant energy substrate to make muscular contraction and to make your neurons work and function, okay? So again, you're switching away from a lot, relying upon glucose predominantly to, more, to a, a more greater proportional increase in both fat oxidation and ketone utilization. Now, you'll notice that glucose never totally drops to say zero because there's various obligatory glucose utilizing cells in the body. So if you think about your red blood cells, they don't have mitochondria, right? Because they could just, it, it would be, it would compromise the function of the red blood cells to deliver oxygen if they were always consuming the oxygen that were, they were supposed to deliver. So. Your red blood cells are just one example of a obligatory glucose utilizing tissue in your, in your body. So they, we must have glucose for our red blood cells to work so that we can have oxygenation throughout the systemic tissues of our body. And there's different neurons and the retinal tissue in your eye that are obligatory glucose utilizing tissues. So the kidneys and the liver are always undergoing this so-called gluconeogenesis when we are in a ketogenic state or when we're doing any fasting. Okay, so this is just the, the consequence, whether you wanna view it as positive or negative of having low glucose, low insulin and high glucagon is we're increasing fat liberation from our fat tissue. We're increasing the synthesis of ketones in the liver and kidneys, and we're also making glucose from anew. And so this brings me to something that I love to emphasize here is gluconeogenesis is not unfavorable this is welcomed, right? We don't want gluconeogenesis to happen all the time. You know, if, if, for example, if you have high glucose in, in the context of like diabetic ketoacidosis would be a situation where we would have an unfavorable gluconeogenesis. But, you know, during exercise, after exercise, when you're fasting, gluconeogenesis is welcomed, again, to provide energy for the obligate glucose utilizing tissues, the red blood cells, the retina, various neurons. And, and so I just want you to realize that it's not bad, it's not unfavorable, and it's totally normal and expected for your glucose to drop. Because what's picking up, the reason why ketones are increasing, the reason why free fatty acids are increasing, you know, and being liberated from your fat cells is to pick up the energetic slack that's kind of that void, to fill the void from having the low glucose. Now, this is where things get a little interesting because you must have ample mitochondrial function, mitochondrial biogenesis, and so forth to utilize th this, these fatty acids because it, it just you know, the process of beta oxidation is inherently dependent upon mitochondrial function, the process of going through the Krebs cycle and so-called oxidative phosphorylation and the, the oxygen dependent breakdown of fats, which we've talked about on other videos. And this is where kind of the body, some of the health benefits ascribed to fasting and keto come in because you're, you're forcing your body through kind of mass action to depend upon mitochondrial function and aerobic breakdown of things. Whereas, you know, sometimes when people are having a high carbohydrate diet or they're insulin resistant, you can have this glycolysis or this anaerobic breakdown of sugar burning 
which creates metabolic waste. It creates more free radical products. It kind of depletes NAD more fast compared to, to aerobic breakdown of fats. Uh, it creates more lactic acid, right? So, so, so this is where, again, fasting comes in and you're putting pressure on the body in a favorable manner to cause your mitochondria to, to function. And so this is the reason why many health promoting longevity seeking individuals promote fasting is, is for making this metabolic switch. Again, I don't wanna get caught up in the weeds, but I just want you to really take away the, the main take home from this video is low glucose is normal, it's expected. Now, the problem would be is if you had low glucose and you had really low ketones and you're fasting. So that might be, okay, something is going on here. Why is your liver and your kidneys not picking up the slack? So if you feel really tired, really sluggish, you're feeling really down when you're fasting, that could mean that something is going on. Maybe there's a single nucleotide polymorphism or small genetic variation in the enzymes that are responsible for making ketones. Maybe there's something else going on uh, from a fatty liver standpoint. So we, we know from research that individuals that have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease might have a impaired ability to synthesize ketones, at, at least initially. So that would warrant further investigation. But what you'll find is when you test most people, I would say, um, that I've worked with at least, when they test their ketones and glucose when they're fasting, they're gonna notice a, a nice increase in ketones. Again, to pick up the energetic slack, glucose is going to be low. Now, in our full Keto Lean Masterclass, what we do talk about is different genetics at play here. Individuals from Saudi Arabian descent and individuals of Portuguese descent do have a high variability in the rate limiting enzyme that makes ketones. And it could mean that potentially prolonged fasting may not be super favorable for, for those individuals. So just kind of keep that in mind that there are genes here that could be tested. I'll put links to some of the papers and in our full class, we dive into those details. But again, this is, I would say, a small subset of the population that needs to be uh, totally concerned with this, but it's still there, something we should be aware of and, and so forth. So hopefully this helps to answer the, the questions and it reinforces something we talk a lot about on this channel, testing. Testing is good. So just going to your local, you know, the, the closest drugstore to where you live, getting a glucometer, start testing your glucose so that you understand, you know, your pre-meal glucose, your post-meal glucose, glucose levels when you're stressed, glucose levels when you're exercising. So you have a good idea about how your lifestyle, your exercise plans, your stress management, your food, how that's affecting your body. It's really helpful. So please do so if you haven't done that, or even better yet, go to your doctor and get a glucometer that tests for it continuously, a continuous glucose meter. Abbott makes one. We've had videos uh, about that with Tab Furchaw. He's been doing this since like 2016, the CEO of FreeFly. We've talked all about this. Um, so you can just go to your doctor and say, hey, I'm worried about diabetes. In my, just say diabetes runs in your family. I really wanna get a glucometer. And they might say, well, your glucose, your labs are normal. Um, and I can't really tell you to personally do this, but if I was in the, those shoes where a doctor wouldn't prescribe this to me, what I would do is probably have some high glycemic food before my next lab work and maybe tell him that I didn't have that food and just say, hey, see, I'm worried about this, so I need to, <laughs> um, you know, to get the, to get the uh, you know, glucometers, right? So you can, there's some workarounds here that, that you can do to uh, help convince or persuade your doctor to giving you this data. And I think it's invaluable. Uh, you know, for me, I found that I've been eating a little carb since 2006, more of a paleo style diet since then. Um, and I found for me, like my diet wasn't affecting my glucose levels. However, stress, unavoidable stress, perceived stress, airports, waiting in line, that was causing a massive swing in a very unfavorable manner in my glucose levels. So it really helped me to realize that I need to meditate, that I need to do breath work, I need to focus on stress reduction. You know, that, that my diet, not as perfect by any means, but, but I largely have that box checked. It's really more my stress management. So I think it's, it's really helpful for you and it would be for your long-term health to figure out, you know, what, what is causing changes in your glucose levels and how can you mitigate that? So as always, I really appreciate you tuning in to this video in, in its entirety. If you enjoyed it, just hit that like button. And if you're not yet subscribed, you gotta do so because we do videos like this and also interview experts in the field. And we have a lot of great feedback from those videos. So you don't wanna miss them. And I would love to know, 
If you found non-dietary factors like stress, like sleep, like relationship struggles, things like that, how that affects your metabolism. So I'll be following the comments below. We'll catch you on a future video down the road.